Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, welcome to uh, ICON, the weekly seminars, especially at the WR faculty here, our senior ones, and the old senior director. Uh, uh, ICON, I'm, first, I'm Sol Sam Mo, I'm a Purdue professor at Purdue Arrow. I'm also a current faculty at ECE, which just started uh, last week. So ICON uh, is an institute for control optimization networks. Uh, uh, which aims to provide a platform for faculty to collaborate on uh, autonomous central system, robotics, and also computation for quantum. And for our weekly seminars, uh, we uh, this semester many focus on in-person seminars. We invite a lot of excellent researchers uh, to uh, for you visit us and give a seminar. And today uh, we have Professor Jacob uh, Sadler from Yale University. So Jacob received his uh, bachelor's degree from UIUC and then a PhD from Princeton, and then he joined Yale uh, and the assistant professor in so 2013, really. And now he's a associate professor at Yale Electrical and Computer Engineer. So Jacob's research mainly focuses on uh, computer architecture and also hardware security. And very recently, he has started to do research on the security for the quantum computing system. So uh, welcome, Jacob, and uh, okay. hope you will enjoy the time here. And uh, also, you know, we did we have one year or that uh, while we are we were on uh, Yale. And uh, thank you very much for your thank help you. for my faculty yeah, application too. Yeah. Uh, I hope so. I believe you will find up this, up this uh, name, a lot of uh, uh, common issues with our faculty and students here that were really hung down with research and a very good memory. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Thanks for everybody for coming. So uh, yeah, feel free to uh, you know, interrupt or ask questions during the talk. I, I don't want to sort of lecture here for, <laughs> for an hour, but uh, uh, today I want to kind of talk about um, quantum computer uh, security, but just as a, as a brief um, as a brief introduction to, um, so CAS Lab is Computer Architecture uh, and Security Lab, which is the group I lead at, at Yale. And uh, we research a lot of different uh, different topics. Um, one of the um, and part of my also PhD and original uh, research team was on processor architecture security. So kind of interested in um, uh, architectural attacks and defenses, um, things like uh, secure processor caches, spectrum meltdown. Um, in addition to sort of uh, classical uh, processor security, also looked at uh, DRAM memory and DRAM security. So for example, using uh, DRAM memories for fingerprinting or physically unclonable functions. Um, yet, yet another research direction we have is on cloud FPGA security. So in this in this direction, we're looking at the security of FPGAs in the cloud. So something like Amazon F1 is a service where you can go to the cloud and rent the rent the FPGA. But uh, for example, in cloud FPGAs, uh, unlike in you know like in, in regular cloud computing, you can reconfigure the FPGA with your custom circuits. So um, so there's a lot of sort of new sort of security attacks where people can basically implement custom circuits remotely um, in the cloud. Um, and um, yet another area that, that we're looking at is, is uh, implementation of cryptographic algorithms. Uh, we're especially interested in post-quantum cryptography and accelerating it uh, in hardware on FPGA. So for um, FPGA security, it's more about securing the FPGA itself. For, for cryptographic hardware implementations, we're basically using FPGA as a uh, platform for prototyping and, and testing. And um, um, the newest research direction since about two or three years, we're looking at uh, quantum computer security or cybersecurity, which is basically looking at how do you uh, protect quantum computers from attacks. So in, uh, in post-quantum cryptography, uh, sort of the attacker is the quantum computer that might try to break the cryptographic algorithms, but in uh, quantum computer security, the quantum computer is the victim. So somebody might try to attack the quantum computer and we want to kind of protect. So uh, in general, in, in, in security, we sort of have to think about all the possible ways that somebody could break a system. So there are usually many, many different research directions to kind of cover all the all the parts. Like, you know, if you secure the CPU, somebody might attack the DRAM. If you, if you secure the DRAM, somebody might attack the FPGA. So you have to kind of think about all the different parts of a, of a computing system. And um, in addition to research, I'm also uh, very interested in sort of in, 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 in education. And um, as kind of related to that, sort of I have uh, uh, two books. One is on uh, processor architecture security, which basically deals with Designing secure uh, processor architectures, which we uh, which I published a few years ago, uh, and then this December uh, we have a book with Ross Tessier from UMass coming on on security of cloud cloud accelerated um, FPGA uh, environment. So kind of um, re really nice way of sort of summarizing bunch of bunch of research into a in, into a concise form, so people can kind of learn from it. And um, this this book actually I'm using 
uh, in my in my current FPGA course as a as, as course reading. So uh, we cover a lot of a lot of different topics, but I think the most exciting one right now is the uh, quantum computer uh, security. So um, again, feel, feel free to interrupt if, if you guys have any um, any any questions. But uh, to begin with, you know, why do we want to sort of research uh, quantum computer um, system security? So the main motivation is just sort of the rapid advancement in the field. So in uh, in last you know recent uh, decade or two, there's a huge increase in, for example, the uh, capabilities of the quantum computers. So starting with 2000s, you had machines with few qubits. Now we have recently have you know, hundreds of qubits. Um, last year, um, in November 22, IBM presented the 433 qubit machine, and they have roadmaps for like uh, 4,000 qubit machines. And just before the summer, uh, they announced that in, in 10 years, they want to have a 100,000 qubit uh, you know, quantum-centric supercomputer. So there's a lot of um, a lot of development uh, in quantum computing, and maybe in some ways it's similar to sort of Moore's law in the very beginning with the rapid uh, increase in the, you know, just available sort of resources. And these quantum computers promise to be able to allow us to generate novel results in, for example, in chemistry or material science. So the, so the end goal is that, you know, you can run, run some algorithms on these quantum computers and find sort of novel, novel solutions. But now the question is, um, how do we make make those machines secure? So no, unfortunately, uh, once you have some sensitive data running on a the computer, there will be somebody that might try to compromise the computer. So we have to basically figure out how do we make them make them secure. And um, I think one also thing that is very 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 interesting to me is that since we're sort of still in this phase of the quantum computers being developed, if we can propose some security uh, defenses right now, there's a good hope of them being incorporated into the into the hardware. So um, maybe another question uh, as, as a means of introduction might have why research quantum computer security right now? Uh, uh, you know, like I just mentioned, the quantum computers are still being developed. So maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's too early, but actually if we look at some, uh, some examples from classical uh, computer security, uh, kind of we learned that you know, for, for hardware related vulnerabilities, it, it seems to take on the order of 10 to 20 years for people to actually find those vulnerabilities. So, you know, so transistors um, were sort of in, in, invented, introduced in uh, 1940s. Uh, then for example, in, in, uh, in maybe 1960s, so these dates are somewhat approximate, but for example, early IBM machines uh, had processor caches, but then cache related security attacks, just cache timing attacks, weren't really found out until 2005. So there's many, many years or maybe even many decades when you had processor caches, but people weren't thinking about cache timing attacks or didn't know about them. Uh, similarly, uh, speculative execution, uh, which is feature available in most modern processor was introduced in 19, uh, maybe around 1990s, but then Spectre and Meltdown weren't sort of found out until 2018. So another um, 10 or 20 years and same, for example, for uh, for DRAM memory, uh, DDR, um, I believe, was introduced around 2000. Uh, and then uh, things like row hammer attack uh, came around in 2014. So usually uh, for hardware related features, there seems to be a, a period of you know maybe 10 or 20 years where we have some hardware technology available, but people really haven't analyzed or haven't found vulnerabilities. So, so this, this kind of gives some motivation that we need to start uh, securing the quantum computers now while they're still being developed before they actually become uh, commercialized. And um, uh, another um, point of, of introduction is that, you know, these quantum computers are, you know, although they're still small, they're not uh, sort of uh, some isolated somewhere uh, in, in, in a basement or in a research lab. Actually, there are many cloud providers today that give you access to cloud-based uh, computers. There's IBM Quantum, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Brack, and these are all the, all the different cloud-based services where you can access uh, different uh, quantum computers, also they're, they're called uh, QPUs or quantum processing units uh, from, you know, IBM of course offers their own, but Microsoft Azure or Amazon Bracket give access to uh, Ion Q, Rigetti, Continuum and, and some other ones. So already today there are quantum computers you can access for free or, or even as a, um, as a paid service. And uh, that means that there are already people that could be, you know, accessing them, maybe trying to run some malicious code on the, um, on these machines. So, uh, so in this context, uh, kind of maybe you can sort of uh, give you an idea of, of, a, of a potential attack surface. So in security, we're trying to kind of always worried about what are the things that, that somebody could attack, and then we want to develop the, the defense. So this is a, a kind of a, a, a diagram maybe uh, of, of a typical uh, superconducting quantum computing system. So uh, on, the, on the end end, you have the, the user plus some quantum program uh, and, and, and a compiler that compiles the program. And then um, since the cloud-based system, they, you know, they submit the jobs over the 
cloud to the quantum computing um, cloud provider. Uh, and then the, on the cloud, quantum computing cloud provider, there's sort of typically uh, three, three main parts. So they have like some classical server, that's sort of the management server that dispatches the jobs to the, uh, to the, uh, to the quantum computers. Um, then one of the main things is that all the quantum computer controllers. So quantum computers require a lot of um, sort of classical support logic in terms of uh, signal generators, mixers, nowadays also FPGA. So there's a, there's a whole rack of, of, of quantum uh, computer controllers. Uh, and then finally you have the, the QPU or the, or the quantum processing unit where the computation is actually performed. And um, in addition, um, there's uh, they can, you can have also like a classical coprocessor. So for, for different, um, uh, different algorithms like um, QAOA or VQE, you might sort of run a circuit on a quantum computer and collect results and then use a classical coprocessor to um, optimize the parameters for the circuit and then dispatch a new circuit. So the, so the, so the classical coprocessor would be used to sort of perform some computation, optimize the, the parameters of your circuit. Uh, and then, so these are sort of all the parts you might find in a, um, in a, in a quantum computer. And then um, now we can kind of think about what are the parts that somebody might try to uh, attack. And so of course, uh, there's the management server, um, the controller, the coprocessor, and the quantum processing unit. So all these parts could be sort of vulnerable to different security attacks. And then our goal is sort of unfortunately to have to analyze all of them, right? It's, it's enough for, for an attacker, for a security perspective, it's enough to kind of compromise just one component. So we have to kind of analyze um, all of them. And, you know, things like the classical management server, it's basically a classical computer. So let's say that's sort of taken care of by existing uh, research, although there's still many problems with, with classical computers, but things like, you know, the quantum computer controllers or the quantum processing unit themselves uh, have basically been not researched before. So this is our, since about two or three years, this is what we're uh, focusing on. And then there's also another um, kind of interesting research direction, which we're um, not doing currently, but I'm also very interested in exploring is looking at the compilers. So um, since the quantum computers have um, uh, very limited resources, the compiler is critical in, in optimizing the circuits. Uh, but that also means that, that if somebody submits their job to the to the compiler, you know, if the compiler is untrusted, they could also try to steal information. So in, in classical security, we're um, often, you know, there's there's a research direction that focuses on sort of on, on untrusted compilers. And then I think the same happens for uh, for quantum uh, computers. So um, in context of, um, you know, of, of, of security and quantum computers, um, at the end of the day, quantum computers are still just computers. They're sort of a, a very specialized type of accelerator. Uh, and then um, there have some sort of benefits and some potential drawbacks. So these are sort of what, what you know, what makes security of quantum computers uh, different from classical you know, computer security. So one of the, one of the benefits of, of quantum computers for sure is that the, you know, you cannot uh, clone or copy quantum state. So in a classical computer, um, a lot of security attacks, basically like a buffer overflow, another attack deals with, you know, get access to some memory location and then you copy the data and then, you know, you steal the password or you steal the machine learning model or, or, or some sensitive information. But in quantum computers, you cannot directly copy the quantum state. So a lot of the attacks that deal with simply copying the data are not, not, not in scope. Um, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of um, kind of new things that we haven't um, experienced in, 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 in classical computers. So for example, there is um, extensive control equipment that I mentioned. So there's a lot of signal generators, mixers, or kind of FPGAs that are involved in, in controlling the quantum computers. Uh, and then these actually have really not been studied from the security perspective before, because, you know, I don't know, uh, in, in classical computers, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't use a, a signal generator to, you know, to control your CPU. So people sort of haven't cared about looking at security of, of, of these sort of components, but now they're critically involved in controlling quantum computers. So we have to look at the, the control equipment. Um, also, uh, for now and then for foreseeable futures, the quantum computers will be very large in size. So it's much more uh, easier to probe and analyze. Like, you know, there are only, you know, probably two or you know, chip works, maybe two or three companies in the world that can analyze an Intel CPU. But for a quantum computer, at least for a foreseeable future, you know, it's the size of a of a server rack or two server racks. So it's much more easier to probe and try to extract some signals from, from within within the computer and the controller. So it makes it easier to, to attack and for, for example, side channel uh, in products. Um, another feature uh, of quantum computers is that um, at least for now, there's no um, quantum, uh, quantum memory and quantum networking. Uh, and then, so what that means is that actually the data that you're computing on is hard coded into the quantum program. So when you submit a program into a quantum computer, uh, all the data is is basically in that program, so you can think of it like all the 
um, all the all the values you're using in the comp in the in the quantum program are constants within your code. So if somebody is able to extract the uh, the quantum program, they actually can get all the data that you use. So uh, we do have um, on ongoing research with with Yongshan in the CS department looking at uh, quantum memory and quantum um, databases. Um, I know there, of course, a lot of other people are working on quantum networking, but at least today these things are not not yet together. And uh, for IBM and Continuum, all these other uh, machines, all the yeah, all the data is basically hard coded, so you can steal it if you steal a program. Yeah, question. I'm sorry. Why is there a disadvantage? Ah, uh, right. So, uh, so in the classical computer, uh, so so there are sort of two things that somebody might want to steal. So one is the is the program, is your algorithm, and the other one is data. And then so for 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 certain cases, the algorithm might be public. So like for an AES encryption, the AES algorithm is public, but the encryption key is the secret. So, so we want to sort of, in some cases you want to protect the program, in some cases you want to protect the data. And in a classical computer, if you steal, right, if you steal a program, the data is usually coming from memory, so it's not hard coded. So if you steal, if I steal the some binary from you know from your from your from your computer, I might not necessarily get the data. And in the quantum computer setting, at least today, if you steal sort of the, the binary of the program, you actually get the input data, which could be your, you know, uh, machine learning parameters, maybe, you know, maybe some, maybe if you have doing some cryptography, maybe some encryption piece. Good question. But really, yeah, per, thanks for the first question. So, um, yeah, so that's that's another another thing um, that makes it different. Um, and then um, also sort of on, on the practical end, these machines are pretty rapidly being de deployed in the cloud. So IBM, Quantum, uh, but also you know, Amazon Bracket, Microsoft Azure, um, Rigetti and Continuum them have their own cloud-based services. So these machines are being available, but there really is no security protections right now in, in place today. So you can, you can submit any job you want. So that kind of makes it, you know, they're kind of vulnerable, they're out there, but they're not, not yet uh, protected. So, um, so that's why we sort of, I think there's sort of, these are new things for, for, for quantum computers and that's what we want to kind of um, tackle. Uh, and then for the security threats, I kind of, kind of can get an idea that there's sort of a lot of a lot of them. We can uh, sort of mainly uh, we can look at the hardware and then the software security threats, and then um, our our groups focusing more on the on the hardware end. And then the uh, the security threats from the hardware are mainly from the resource sharing. So in any cloud based setting, you know they have multiple programs running on the same on the same computer. You know there's some resources sharing, and that will lead to uh, potential um, security issues. Um, and then another. Um, aspect from the hardware is these uh, classical uh, controllers and the in the support equipment that they could be leaking uh, information. One one research direction which we haven't looked at yet, but um, you know we or somebody has to look at is also untrusted hardware and hardware trojans. So uh, for now we assume that the hard the quantum computer hardware itself is trusted, mm -hmm. but as things become uh, more 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 of a commodity, then you know then they're sourcing parts from you know untrusted vendors and there might be issues with the hardware. Uh, itself. So untrusted hardware or hardware trojans is another research direction that's sort of um, unexplored in the quantum computing context today, since uh, for now we sort of we fully fully trust IBM or all the other other machines. And uh, there's also a lot of security threats, which I think is a great um, you know great direction to collaborate with other people on more on looking you know on on bugs or or viruses in quantum programs. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, malicious or buggy compilers. Um, you know, maybe even some uh, bugs in the APIs or, or, or other management software. So there's uh, there's a lot of uh, unexplored issues in security of quantum computers, and we're sort of just starting to tackle the you know the you know, part of the part of the iceberg. But it's a pretty big iceberg in terms of things that you can uh, that you can explore. Um, cool. So uh, so for this talk, um, I wanted to kind of focus on the on the hardware part, of course. Oh, question. Yeah. Um, can you use the compiler to uh, what is the central other compiler process? Uh, and uh, yeah, the submits code which can be detected for any suspicious Yeah, so so the, the compile the compiler can be either either local or, or remote. So for example, if you use Qiskit, you can um you can compile the for the backend locally or or the cloud provider can put, compile for you. So uh for example, um there are also um you know a lot of startups whose goal is to develop their own specialized compiler, so they don't sell a they don't sell a quantum computer, but they spe they specialize in sort of optimizing the code. So so that that in a case, I think that's the most applicable case for the compiler issues is like if there's a third party company that sells some super specialized compiler, you know, on one hand 
you want to use them because maybe they give you the best results for, for running, but make, but at the same time, maybe they could be stealing your code. So if there's sort of like a third party compiler or, or a compiler service, uh, you could, uh, that could be an issue. Um, yeah, yeah, but um, I mean, in, in some sense, you have no choice. You have to use some compiler and, you know, like we assume LLVM or GCC is trusted. Uh, so, but, uh, but but you, you yeah and you and you end up having to use some some compiler and um, there are some some projects um I think there's one or two projects out there already looking at code obfuscation to protect it from from an untrusted compiler um, I think a lot of a lot of uh, uh, I think a lot of um, may, maybe more than in the classical computers in, in quantum computers um, very few people will actually own a quantum computer so a lot of people who develop some cool algorithms are not themselves going to be controlling the hardware. Like if I develop like a classical algorithm, I can run on my laptop and I don't have to send it to Amazon. But I think that the, the scarcity of quantum computers makes it such that the, when, when you the, the person who develops algorithm doesn't have the hardware, so they, they're vulnerable to, to people attacking. But yeah, I think there were questions. Uh, uh, this might be incorrect, but as I understand it, classical computing is used to interface with the hardware, right? So shouldn't classical security work for all of the parts except for the quantum, like, except for the last? Uh, right. Um, so they 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 can. Um, that, that's a, that's a great question. So um, so for so that so let's say the classical security maybe can take care of the server and then the call processor. But for example, for the for the controllers, which are for example arbitrary waveform generator, nobody ever before looked at power side channels from an arbitrary waveform generator. It's just not a it's not a thing. So, so uh, these are just basically these are things that haven't been explored because they weren't used in a in a sort of in a, in a computing mm -hmm. context before. Uh, but that, but that, that, but that's a good question. So, a lot of so, for example, we're we're not looking at at, at networking because you know the networks are encrypted and everything, so we don't have to worry about those things. Yeah. Right, that that's a good right. So so uh so actually so for the for the sharing, I, you can have sort of temporal and spatial sharing. So in temporal one, basically one user runs after the other and sort of multiplies on the machine. And then and and in 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 spatial, you could have multiple users running in, in parallel. So um so we we're sort of considering both scenarios. So uh the the first the first um the first thing I want to talk about the information leaks and QPUs looks at the at the first case where you have sort of shots of of different circuits from different programs sort of alternating on one on one computer. So then they're not running concurrently, but we're also looking at and multiplexing. So there are uh, some papers from, from Georgia Tech and other places that are already sort of exploring multi-tenancy and how to run multiple uh, multiple users or multiple programs in parallel. So uh, we sort of, uh, I don't know, we have to anticipate all the futures and then uh, kind of be kind of be, be make sort of security protections for all those possibilities. And and I, I agree, I agree sort of, you know, some people argue that there'll be just, you know, few quantum computers that sort of are dedicated to running one job in a super secure location, or there could be, you know, many computers in, in different data centers. So um, I, I guess that's kind of the, the exciting part is we don't know what the, what the future is yet. So kind of have to consider all the options. Um, but that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, okay, so so maybe maybe jumping into the um, the one of the research we did on the information leaks inside the QPUs. So um, you know why why an attacker might try to leak information in QPUs. So main thing is that there's a resource sharing within the within the QPUs, and as we show, that can lead to to information leaks. Uh, and then what we actually demonstrate is that although uh, you cannot leak the full quantum state, so you cannot copy the, the full quantum state, you can leak some information after the after the measurement. So in this um, in this scenario, we're focusing on the temporal sharing where you might have a victim user and an attacker user sort of alternating on the qubits on the same uh, quantum computer. Um, 
and and, and then I'll talk later about some uh, spatial sharing where you have users running in uh, in in, in pair. So um, the information leaks with temporal sharing basically. Uh, what we're looking at is that the sequential execution of, of users uh, on the same hardware, sort of in a, in a leaf fashion, uh, can lead to uh, inspiration leaks if there's no strong isolation or reset between the users. So um, basically that, that idea, maybe this picture illustrates it better. You have sort of, you know, you have a user that's running on some um, on some qubits and in these, um, in these kind of, in these diagrams in, in, in quantum computing, typically that the time goes from from left to right, and then the lines represent different qubits. So we have you know, user A running on a few qubits, then you have some reset operation that resets the state of the qubits, uh, and then you have another user and, and so forth. And um, I should mention that in, 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 in quantum computers and qubits, there's no uh, there's no way to sort of like write a zero into, into a qubit. So you, like in, in a classical computer, you sort of, when a program finishes, you can overwrite the memory with all zeros and you can start a new, new program. But in quantum computers, uh, in qubits, you have to you have to have a mechanism to uh, to reset the qubit, uh, and I'll talk about two mechanisms for for reset and why there's some problems with them. But there's you know it's it's not as easy as simply just like writing zero to a qubit and then and then letting another user run. Uh, but in so so in a, in a so you have to have this reset between the users, and if it's single tenant, you have one user after the other, um, and if you have multi tenant, then might be like different users on on different qubits. But in the end, you still have to have these reset. Um, operations between the between the users. So, so one of the key features of of or the or enabling features for for quantum computers is having an efficient way of resetting the qubits uh, between the program between the shots of different um, different circuits. Uh, and then as a, as a small uh, as a very small small detour to uh, to quantum computing. So um, in quantum computers, we of course deal with uh, with with qubits instead of classical bits, which are a superposition of of one uh, of zero and one. Uh, and then typically we have a sort of an abstraction of a two-state kind of mechanical system. Um, actually, there's um, a lot of research now on using acute trids and sort of using more, multiple, uh, multiple, uh, more more than two states, uh, which actually leads to some security problems, which we we have demonstrated. But but for this talk, we assume it's a it's a two-state uh, kind of mechanical system. Uh, and then effectively, the the state of the qubit can be represented by this uh, by this equation, where you have the um, alpha. Alpha and beta as the two two parameters, and alpha corresponds to the uh, to the to the to the ground state, and then beta corresponds to the higher um, higher energy state. Uh, and then you can represent uh, the qubits also as the uh, so typically we use this block sphere to represent uh, um, the state of the qubits. And then uh, I'll come back to this later. But the theta uh, is the angle from the uh, from the z axis. So basically, if the theta is zero, uh, you're in the zero state, and then the theta is pi. Your vector points down in your one state, and this will this will come come in handy in in, in a little bit. Uh, but um, but since we represent uh, the the qubit in, in in this way, um, the beta parameter um actually corresponds to, like I mentioned, the higher energy state, and that higher energy state um uh, decays with uh, with time. So the so in quantum computing, there's a uh, uh, what's called decoherence or relaxation time or, or T one if if you use IBM quantum. So basically, there's a time that uh, the qubits decohere. So after the decoherence time, the qubits will, will lose their uh, will lose their state. And um, and just for some reference, you know, currently in, in IBM quantum, the decoherence time is around uh, around fifty or or hundred uh, microseconds. Uh, and then for the for the newer paid machines, uh, it's around uh, two hundred uh, microseconds. So this is so this is the time within which you can do uh, do the computation. This is the decoherence time, uh, but it also uh, comes in um, relation to the to the reset. So one way to reset the qubits is to basically let the qubits stay idle and then decohere to the ground state. So if you keep the qubits idle for uh, up to let's say one millisecond, um, all the state will be reset and then basically qubit enters the, the zero state and then you can run uh, another another circuit. So um, the good thing is that it of course erases all the all the state in the qubits. Um, the bad thing is that this scales with the decoherence time. So as people have better and better quantum computers, the decoherence time or T1 increases. So you have to wait longer for the qubit to decohere. So, so in the future, as, as you have better and better computers, you'll spend some time doing computation and then you spend the same time or even longer just waiting for the qubits to decohere before you can run the next circuit. So this is actually wasting a lot of a lot of useful computation. Time. So uh, so you want to have a better, better way. Uh, to reset the qubits to sort of not waste the computation time uh, that could be 
used for, for actually running circuits. So, so there's an alternative, um, which is called the, the reset gate, uh, it's, uh, implemented by IBM, and I also believe uh, Rigetti is implementing it. Uh, and then the reset gate um, is much faster, around mi one microsecond. So it's a much more efficient way to, to reset the qubits. But um, as we as we show, basically, um, there's some potential information leakage across the, the reset gate. Um, and then the way the reset gate works, it uh, it's actually composed of, of a measurement. So you measure the, the qubit state. So Q is the qubit, C is the, the, the classical register. So you measure the qubit state into the classical register. Uh, and then after a measurement, basically the state collapses either to a zero or one. So the, so the quantum state becomes classical times zero or one. So if, if, it's, if it's already zero, then you do nothing. If it's a one, then you apply an, an X gate, which basically flips the state of the qubit to, to, to zero. So it's already, it's already zero, you do nothing. If it's one, you apply the, the X gate. And if this mechanism works perfectly, then you have reset the qubit um, perfectly and then everything is okay. Um, but unfortunately, there can be some uh, imperfection which leads to the to the information leaks as I, as I'll show. So um, so there's sort of two two ways that somebody could um, abuse um, an, an imperfect uh, reset operation. So uh, one, uh, if the, if an attacker runs before the imperfect reset and then the user runs, then we could think of it sort of like a fault injection where you sort of you set um, you set the qubit to to certain states and then. Because the reset is imperfect, when the second when the when the shut off the next user runs, the initial state is not zero. So that that means that their sort of the initial state is not 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 sort of not correct, and which could lead to some in, in, incorrect uh, computation. Um, uh, the other case, which is what we focus on uh, currently, uh, is a side channel attack. So in a side channel attack, the idea is that you sort of get some information that you shouldn't be able to. Uh, and in this case, the idea is the user shut off the user circuit runs, then there's a reset. But because the reset is not perfect, maybe the attacker can get some information about the user. So they can leak basically the final state of the of the user qubits to the uh, to the attacker. So we're sort of exploring in, at least in this research, we explored how to uh, or showed how you can have uh, information leak across the imperfect reset. And um, for the for the threat model and the attack setup, uh, again we have the user, uh, we have one or more more resets, and then after that. The, the attacker performs a measurement. So basically, as soon as they get access to the qubit, they just do a measurement. Uh, and then if they if you repeat that uh, multiple uh, multiple times, the attacker can try to correlate the their measurements to the state of the user before the reset. So the idea is like based on the measurement, can I figure out what is the state of the user's qubits before the before the reset? Uh, and then here the reset is again each of those uh, each of those uh, reset gates. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 the reset so the reset would be um uh, enforced or uh so the cloud provider or whoever manages the quantum computer would uh you know they they, they run a shot of a circuit, then they then they apply reset and they run a shot of a different circuit from a different user. Okay, so, so you're doing the cloud. So might be the no, so so what 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 we're trying to what we're trying to demonstrate is that um, a, a cloud provider or, or a cloud computer provider would want to use a reset over thermalization because it's much faster. But if if they use this reset mechanism, then there's some information leak. So we want to eventually propose a better reset mechanism. So the so the attacker here is the second user who wants to learn about the information about the first user. Uh, and they're able to learn the information because the reset is not perfect. Okay. So that is basically the question as to the dysfunction. Um, it's something cyber attacks. Uh, is that something that you should apply the software provider? So, 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 yeah, so the cloud certifier, um, the, um, so they issue a, a shot of one user. So this is so one so you know the victim submits some program to run on the quantum computer so the shot runs then when the shot finishes the quantum uh, controller or provider issues the reset to reset the qubit allow another shot to run and then let's say they schedule a shot of a different user to run so these are so these are two so these are two separate users um, and then um, in this case you know one shot of one user is scheduled before the second and between there's a reset. 
So like if, if you and I try to run our programs on, 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 on the quantum computer, maybe I want to start try to steal some information from you. So you you happen to run first, and then the qubits are reset, and then I run. Oh. But then because the underlying mechanism is not perfect, I, I get some information about you. So here, yeah, so here the um the attacker is the second the second user. So this, yes. Yeah, so, so oh, yeah. Good question. So there is no. Uh, so here there is no extra privileges and there is no physical access. Uh, it's basically just two users running, running, uh, running jobs on their remote computer. So like, yeah, like if you and I, you know, go to Amazon and submit two jobs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, whenever you run in like this, you have to run it like a thousand times, right? That's how you would extract information. So in this scenario, you're assuming that. You would run your program after the user of the time. Like you would yeah. run, you would run. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. That's that's a great point. Right. So so in so like like you mentioned in, in um in, in the at least in the current noisy quantum mm -hmm. computers, you have to execute your circuit many hundreds of thousands or you know two thousand times. So and yet so that so for our attack setup, we assume that you know the user, the two, the user and the attacker sort of have to run a thousand times and they're alternating the shots of their of their circuits. Yeah, exactly. So that's one, uh, maybe another feature of quantum computing is that since you have to run the same circuit many times, you have more opportunities for the attacker to perform a measure. Uh, that's a great, uh, great question. Uh, so yeah, and so um, so just that, just to visualize, um, you know, if the if sort of before the reset you have zero and one state, um, then ideal reset reset everything to zero, and then in practice it actually is uh, a little bit off. Which leads to the to the potential uh, information, and um, these are maybe the the, the most uh, most exciting exciting graphs that that we collected from from the machines. And I want to also always acknowledge IBM for giving us access to the um, to the to the to the machines. Um, that so here um, so in these graphs um, maybe uh, again so the the x axis um, is again is the the theta angle. So if if the theta angle is zero, you're pointing out, and you're State is zero. If theta angle is high, you're pointing down, and your in your uh, your state is uh, is one. And then these graphs show the probability of measuring a one state after the reset. So if the if the one state, uh, which is the so uh, if the if the theta angle is zero, then the probability of uh, of measuring one state should be zero. So you're here, uh, if the theta angle is high, the probability of measuring one should be hundred percent. So you're here. So without any reset or anything. If we get this kind of a curve that as the theta goes from zero to pi, you know, the probability of measuring one state goes from zero to a one. So this is the, the, the normal thing. Um, and then in these experiments, we, we set the qubits into different different states, different theta angles, and form the measurements. Uh, and then here, so uh, you can see that uh, this is sort of maybe this is the, uh, the first interesting graph. So the idea is here, right? After, after so no resets. Then basically, you know, if theta zero is probably zero, uh, uh, pi is almost one because there's some noise. It's not perfectly one, but it's almost almost one. But actually, if you look after after what you said, you can actually see that this line is not flat. So if uh, so, depending on the theta angle before the reset, the the measurement after reset results in this graph where if the theta if the state of the qubit before the reset was was zero, you get sort of here. here. And if the state of the qubit um, before reset was was pi or, or, or one, you're here. So the attacker, basically what the attacker can do is that if they know um, how many resets are being performed between the victim and, and the attacker, they can you know, sort of figure out which graph they're on. And then basically they can measure the probability of, they can get the probability of measuring one for the, for the qubit. And if they, and then for example, here they know if, if I measure something close to 0.8, then I know that the victim was in one state, and if I measure something close to zero, then the victim was in a in a zero. State. So this way, I can uh, potentially leak the final state of the victim's cube. And then this is for each for each qubit. So this is qubit zero on on Jacquard. And 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 some some cool things too is actually if you apply more than one reset. So uh, if you have you know multiple resets uh, between the between the users. Uh, Actually, uh, things don't necessarily get better. Um, 
maybe you know in some cases things get more noisy, but in some cases it actually gets less noisy with more reset. So um, we don't know the actual uh, underlying implementation. So um, um, IBM for sure performs a lot of signal processing after they do the measurements. So um, these are sort of um, these are sort of the measurements we get and we try to interpret them. But the, the key part is that the, since these lines are not flat, you can get some information from the from the user. And you can see it on, on different machines uh, for different uh, qubits. Um, also for some, some machines, at least at the time, for example, on Perf, uh, you can see that you know, one reset was kind of similar to the other ones, but suddenly two resets actually, that the probability went back from almost zero to almost one. So there was some, maybe even a functional problem with the, with the reset. So, oh yeah, question. Does the attacker know the, how many resets are there? Is it random? Uh, uh, very good question. So for, 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 for 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 this, um, we we assume the attacker knows how many resets. So so the sort of following you know following this idea that the you know, that in any any security measures should not be so you, you don't want to do like security by obscurity. So the cloud provider would tell you how many resets I do. So it's kind of public how it works, and then so the attacker would know like you know there's there's one or two resets or or, or however many. But here we just want to show that applying more resets doesn't necessarily help. Um, and um, so, uh, so based so based on um, based on this uh, measurements and observation, um, our students work on, on kind of developing a model so that you can, if you collect the measurements, can you can you infer the um, can you predict what was the state of the qubit before uh, the measurement? And then we sort of restricted ourselves to just data of zero and pi since um, after the victim's measurements, the the qubit state collapses to either zero or one. So this is kind of the two most uh, interesting cases. Um, and then you can see that uh, you know for, for different number of, of, of resets for different Jakarta or Lagos for different machines, you can see you have a pretty good accuracy, you know, 90%, something around 80%. So you have a, a good a good good prediction accuracy. So this means this means that uh, you can extract the information from the from the user. So on one hand, the cloud provider or the quantum computer provider would want to implement the reset to do things much faster. But in that case, they might be vulnerable to the security information leak. So based on that, they can try to you know design a new uh, security uh, mechanism. So <laughs> very interesting. Is is there like a reset dynamics? So like say like physically like like in paper or something for the circuits to reset the states, or like is there any dynamics involved on the reset so that attacker can basically solve the problem? Uh, that, that's a good question. So, um, so, so, so um, yeah, yeah, so we don't know for the reset gate, so that would be something to... Uh, so that's, a, yeah. that's Yeah, so we don't, oh, I mean, we know the structure of the reset gate, but we don't know how it's actually mm -hmm. implemented. Mm -hmm. But that would be really, really interesting. And um, actually, uh, actually, the, the main reason that the reset gate is, is not perfect is uh, most likely the inaccuracy in the measurement. So the reset gate is a measurement followed by the X gate, but the single qubit... Uh, uh, gate errors are pretty low, so this basically means there's some problem. You know, there's some issues with the measurement, or the the measurement axis doesn't line up with the with the X gate axis. So that's sort of, um, I mean, the, the 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 main thing here also here is that the uh, the um, the imperfection is very small, so it might not affect actual computation. But if you have a dedicated attacker who's purely looking for the for the information, they they can do this. Um, so. Um, so um, good uh good, good question we don't, so we, we uh uh so we we don't know so the so the so basically for the superconducting qubit machines um they're manufactured qubits so they're so their fabrication differences um sort of it, it very it depends on the machine and it also depends, you know, I only showed qubit zero for each machine, but each qubit is slightly different. So they're sort of uh, better and then worse qubits. Yes. So, so right, right. So that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, I mean, so we shared some of the information with IPM. I mean, we we don't have access to any confidential design data, so we don't know how the I, the reset is, is is implemented. But I think that's that's the that's exactly the the purpose of the research to kind of find out these problems and then 
hopefully people can take some action based on those problems. And then if you know if you're if you're insider who has some details how the hardware is implemented, that can give you, you know, you can actually take action on it. Um, uh, cool, cool. So, uh, so this was kind of the uh, the basic uh, research, uh, and um, I don't know if I should officially end in uh, some time or uh, um, since we started. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe maybe few minutes. Real research. Okay, sure, okay, cool. Yeah. I, I have a lot of slides. I just don't want to <laughs> keep people here, so I'll I'll find a good point to end. But I just wanted to uh, um, kind of as a, as an extension, um, one one thing that I want to also kind of talk about, which we've been recently working on, is that. Um, in the current, in what I presented, uh, you have a uh, you have a victim, you have a reset, and you have the measure. Now, uh, maybe obvious, maybe not so obvious. Um, if you submit a, a quantum circuit that could consist of only a measurement, um, it's obviously very weird. <laughs> like nobody nobody has a circuit that's only a measure. So it's very easy to to spot that uh, you know this is just some somebody just messing with us, right? Doing something they shouldn't be doing. So. Uh, so what what we've been working on now is kind of trying to understand if an attacker can design a more, more stealthy attack. So what a more stealthy attack means is that you still have the victim, uh, you still have the the reset, but now you you insert some masking circuit C before the measurement. So the attacker controls uh, the the masking circuit and the measurement. Uh, they know exactly they can choose what this is. They know what this is. But the idea is that that this the circuit together should look somewhat like a or, or the, the question is, could this circuit look somewhat like a normal quantum circuit? So it wouldn't be obviously a suspicious thing, but at the same time, could you get some information about, from this measurement about the, the final state of the cube? So since, um, so one, one helpful thing here is that um, the quantum gates and quantum computers are fully invertible. So if you know the, if you know the circuit, uh, you can basically invert it and figure out what is the, you know, what is the state of the qubits before. So uh, you can, uh, yeah, all the gates are, uh, like, well, um, all, all the gates except like reset or measurements are um, are unitary, so you can you can invert them. So this is so if the attacker knows the, the unitary of this um, of the circuit, they can invert it and they can figure out what's the state right before the reset. And then like we just showed, if we know the state right before the reset, you can figure out what's the state of the, of the victim. So um, I, I know I don't have I don't have much time, so I'll just jump very quickly. But that basic idea is you know try different circuits to that we can put in between the so this is the reset, uh, this is some circuit for example an identity circuit that's composed of two x gates and then this is the measurement, uh, and then we try um, try different circuits to see if uh, if the attacker could recover some uh, some information. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> so that would be this point. So. Uh... It's simple like that you allow the service provider to see what kind of communications can that be able to portray. So, so to me, it's kind of a violation of the user privacy to allow. So what kind of conversation that, that that information should be linked to the service provider? Ah, good question. So so in all of this, the cloud provider sees everything you're doing. So you have no privacy. So okay. you have no privacy from the cloud provider. Uh, what we're trying to protect oh, okay. is the privacy of one user from another user. Uh, we do. I do have some backup sites. I can talk about trusted execution environments where we protect from the cloud provider. But uh, beyond some legal requirements, IBM knows exactly what you're executing or continuing for other companies. So, uh, so there is there is no there is no privacy from the cloud provider at this point at least. But that's that's an excellent question, and I have some backup sites about kind of how to deal with <laughs> with that situation. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, so so just um, it's kind of um, I mean, we tried to you know basically we tried to put different circuits uh, between the uh, between the the res between the reset and the measurements, and then uh, since they're invertible, we can try to recover the information before the circuit. Um, things like you know identity circuits, uh, different single qubit Rx and Rz um, uh, gate operations that rotate the qubits um, by different angles. Uh, we also looked at uh, some uh, two qubit uh, CNOT gate circuits, and then also we tried to look at using some actual uh, circuits from the QASM benchmark. Uh, so this would sort of look most most interesting. And um, just as uh, just a kind of uh, demonstration, so um, when when no masking circuit is used, you get this similar graph where the attacker can sort of uh, correlate the uh, the 
dB, basically the measurement to the to the state of the qubit before the um, before the uh, before the reset. And then this is the, the the bottom one is the same as the top one, but now there's an identity circuit between the the, the reset and the measurement. And uh, you can see that it you know after some noise it looks very similar. So if you know it's an identity circuit between the 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 the, the reset and the measurement, the attacker can still figure out the the, the probabilities. Um, and then uh, to in, in in addition or or instead of sort of looking sort of at these graphs directly, uh, we also looked at sort of defining this signal to noise uh, ratio metric to kind of help us think about um, what is the um, you know how much maybe information attacker could could get or or how how yeah, you know, how, how much they could could recover. So that basically that's for the signal to noise ratio that we define the signal basically as the, as the amplitude of, of, of these curves and then, and then the noise is the basically the standard deviation. So the you know the, the smaller the standard deviation and then the bigger bigger the curve, then it's more easy to identify these two points. Uh, that, that, you know, if there's a lot of noise and the standard deviation is large, then this sort of looks more noisy and it's hard to identify. So so we kind of come up with this uh, with matrices where you can plot the SNR. And then, for example, on one axis, you have number of resets. And then on the other axis, you have number of, of for example, the depth of the exit. So for the, for the identity circuit, even, you know, even if you, if you put in many, many, many identity circuits, actually, that doesn't decrease the signal-to-noise ratio much. So you could have many identity circuits between the reset and the measurement, and you can still get more, more information. And in. But you can, for example, as you kind of visually you saw from these graphs, and as you increase the reset, Things get get a little worse, and we can look at things like, uh, for example, for the single qubit, uh, for the single uh, qubit gates with, with R Rx and R Z rotation, certain angle rotation angles, um, you know, work you know, sort of better for the attacker. There's better signal to noise ratio uh, for for pi over two. The rotation peak, uh, the, the noise is pretty pretty high. So so the attacker could choose the the masking circuit in a certain way, but this also Let's ask as the defenders think about what circuits are sort of sort of uh, suspicious. Um, so just kind of just to uh, just to summarize, kind of we try to show that for you know for 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 this type of attack, you could use a masking circuit C uh, for certain um, for certain single qubit gates. Um, the attacker can use sort of these identity circuits or simple rotation RZ rotations to and still recover the information. But for example, for the uh, C not C not gates and larger circuit, uh, it becomes kind of much more difficult to recover the the information. So um, so as a as a for example a compile time uh, defense uh, against the this attack, we could implement sort of a uh, an antivirus or a, or a checker that basically you know. Um, if you have a if you have a circuit that only consists of you know identity gates and a measurement, that's probably a, a suspicious circuit. Or if you have a circuit that only has you know single qubit gates, um, uh, before the measurement, it could also be suspicious. So you can sort of analyze um, the behavior of, of the attacker and then come up with these heuristics, and then you know either in, in the compiler or in the, the server, you know the cloud management engine. You could check the user circuit, and like you, like there was a question earlier. Since the cloud provider has full access to the circuit, they could apply some rules to check your circuit before they let it, uh, let it run. So that's a, uh, um, that's uh, one defense. And um, I think I'm out of time, so I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll skip to the. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll skip to a, uh, my last slide, but I can come back to, to, to kind of discuss other topics. Um, so, uh, so just to you know, just one one slide to kind of summarize. Um, as, as you might have might have gathered, uh, but my my view is that sort of the next frontier in, in computer security is um, quantum computer security. Um, there's a lot of development in quantum computers. Uh, they'll you know be running sensitive programs, and sort of we need to find ways to uh, to secure uh, secure these designs. And uh, these are just some of our some of our papers. Um, I did want to um, acknowledge our our colleagues. Um, at, at Yale and, and, and other places. So these are faculty I'm working on, on different projects, some of which I, I didn't show here, and then uh, some uh, current and former uh, students that have uh, kind of basically did all the, all, all the work. And um, last, last but not least, uh, uh, next month, um, I'm organizing the first quantum computer cybersecurity symposium. It's going to be on, on Zoom or in person if you want to visit a nice uh, Connecticut New Haven. So uh, please come. We have, um, we have a bunch of talks uh, from uh, academia, 
and uh, equal number from uh, from industry. So uh, a lot of people in, in industry are actually already interested in, in securing quantum computers. So uh, it should be an, an interesting event. But um, thank, thank you thank you for <laughs> listening to, to that talk. And um, um, hopefully we have some more discussions after this. Yes. Before we go into the discussion session, I'll... Oh, yeah, we can stop the recording. So... Um,